So I think we can all agree when I say that the end of the year is normally a really insane time of year. There is so much to wrap up. There's so much to do. There's presents to buy. There's things to prepare for. And a lot of people kind of get to December and think, all right, I'm gonna save New Year's resolutions for January when I'm feeling a lot less overwhelmed. But what I've found is if you really highly value uh, knowledge growth and personal development, then dedicating even just a little bit of time in December towards your personal growth goals in the next year can be really helpful. So for that reason, this video will contain the top five books that made a huge impact on my life this year. And the reason why is we've got a couple weeks left of the year. And if you use your time wisely, your downtime wisely, you can help yourself in 2023 or in the next year by reading one of these books and seeing what kind of an impact it has on you to set you up for all of your beautiful goals in the next year. So my first recommendation is a really interesting one. It's called The Old Money Handbook by Byron Tully. I've seen this floating around YouTube a little bit, but I don't see very many people talk about it outside of that, to be honest. Um, a lot of people that I know are into personal development. It's a big topic in my workplace as well. And with a lot of my clients, you know, I see very few people referencing this book and it's absolute gold. So essentially we've seen the old money style kind of floating around from TikTok and then onto Instagram. And it's really made its way through social media and through the younger generation. But the style has nothing really to do with what old money actually is. So old money, and the definition varies, but generally it is a, a family that has inherited several generations worth of wealth. And generally what happens is because they haven't earned that money specifically themselves because they inherit it, it is their role and their duty to really look after this money properly. And this book really goes into the mindset that they have in order to look after and grow their wealth. And that's really refreshing because if we look at like new money in today's society and there's nothing wrong in fact, it's a beautiful thing to work really hard and to earn your own money. But oftentimes when that happens, the role models that we get in today's society don't necessarily know how to spend money very well. A lot of it tends to be about brands, about splashing out, about looking a certain way and perception. And the old money handbook kind of flies in the face of all of that. So if I were to look at my biggest takeaways, one of them, it, it references that the family that drives a Mercedes and is going through McDonald's drive through does not actually have their priorities straight. And I mean, it's, it's harsh, but it's true. And the, the point of it isn't whether you drive Mercedes or whether you ever go to McDonald's. I mean, I'm a busy mother. I certainly take my, my children to McDonald's sometimes. But the point is that if your focus is more on brands and what you drive and how you look in the bags that you have, then your family's overall health and well-being, then you've got things backwards. And one thing that old money, according to the book, knows how to do very well is invest in their family's minds and health in order to grow wealth in future rather than investing in what they look like from an outside perspective. Another key takeaway is the core values of old money, health, education, etiquette, and quality. So it goes a lot into how to properly invest in your family's health, how to look after their education and how to actually prioritize that, um, how to teach your children manners and how to develop an etiquette of your own to ensure that you move very smoothly through different social circumstances and that, that really helps you to come out on top and how to invest in things that are of high quality rather than what gets you immediate gratification and whether you're old money or not, because if you're old money, I would assume that you've grown up with all these values, right? But for those of us that are certainly not, it is so helpful to understand and learn how those that are born into money actually look at money because if you're born with it and your whole duty is to help preserve that money for the next generation, you're gonna have some fabulous tips on how to actually save it and live a really fulfilled life. My next recommendation is Atomic Habits. This book has absolutely exploded. So every time I've Googled it, it's up like another million purchases, basically. It is huge. There's a lot of books out there these days on how to form habits and how to be really efficient, but there's nothing that I found that's really quite as succinct as this book. And I really think that's been the biggest key to a success and why it's so well known globally. So if I had to look at my biggest takeaways, and there are so many, by the way, everyone that I've asked about this book that's read it has a completely different takeaway to me, which just goes to show how much you can actually take away from one book. But one of my biggest takeaways is in order to build habits properly, you need to identify what you want your identity to be and then build the habits around that. So to give you an example, I had this issue for the longest time with spending my time on weekends exercising as a family. 
I don't know what it was. I just kind of associated it with like sporty families. I just couldn't quite get into the habit and I preferred to do other things with my time on weekends. And then I read the Old Money Handbook, which talks a lot about how the health of your family should be your absolute priority and thought, well, gee, Bethany, that's true, isn't <laughs> it? Should be common sense, but I just hadn't quite thought of it that way. And since then, I formulated my identity around classy people are healthy. If you want to be classy, look after your health. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. The point is that I built that identity and I started, therefore, to take my family out on way more walks this year. We invested in bikes and we go bike riding together. I now drink green juice really regularly, which I previously associated more with like, I don't know, hippie yoga types, which again, like my mind has changed now, right? But, but this is the point is that if you can take, rather than trying to formulate habits just based on what society is trying to tell you to do is best, if you can look at the identity that you really want and then build your habits around that, you have a much higher chance of being successful. So the example that it gives is if you look at like a smoker, for example, and they say, I'm trying to quit smoking then that means that their identity is someone who is trying to quit. Whereas if a smoker were to say, I'm a non-smoker or I no longer smoke, then their identity is, I'm not a person that smokes. And when you tell your brain what you are, it's much easier for the habits to follow. There's actually a lot of scientific evidence behind that. You can literally retrain your neural pathways based on the things that you repeat to yourself over and over again. So it's a brilliant piece of advice that I use all the time now, even if it seems like it's in a silly way, it really, really works. The second is something I think is... I don't know if you can hear the birds outside, but every time I do a video, there's some kind of a weird noise in the background. So the, the second one is motion versus action, and it's something I think is really relevant to I guess today's generation. So if you look at motion, that's generally the learning, the new things that you want to implement, doing the courses, reading the books, working with the coaches, all of that. But then there is action and that's actually implementing what you've learned and living it. And there is a huge difference between reading every self-help book under the sun and actually changing as a result of that. So when you're thinking about how much you've maybe learned over the past year, it's really good when you're looking at the new year to think about how much of that was motion, so like learning, versus action, actually implementing what you've learned and making real changes to your life that have benefited you. The next book is so old and so good. It's How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I still see it referenced all the time and honestly this book was written in 1936 but it is so ahead of its time. If you think back to like the 80s and 90s, when you think sales, for example, you normally think like greasy car salesman, like talking too much, trying to force you to see things from his point of view. And this book is the total opposite of all of that. And again, it's written in the 1930s, but it speaks a lot to how to influence those around you by listening really well, by, by presenting your point of view and theirs and really hearing out both sides, by being empathetic. These are all things I think that we kind of forgot about over the last few decades that are really coming to the forefront of not just the workforce again, but relationships. This is something that's spoken a lot about now, which is listening really well and being empathetic. And this book covers all of that to the nth degree. So if I were to look at key takeaways, one is to let the person that you're speaking with do the most talking. This is something we as human beings really struggle with, but you know the old saying, two ears, one mouth, means you should be listening twice as much as you speak, right? But it's really hard to do. But if you think back to the most fascinating conversations that you've had over the last few months, I bet if you really think about it, you were doing a lot of the talking and that's why you felt it was so fascinating. This isn't always the case, of course, but the point is if you were able to learn how to really develop your listening skills, do active listening and really find a subject that the person that you're speaking to is fascinated by and let them speak, that's one of the best ways to, to win friends and influence people and really build your relationships. Another is something I see you utilized a lot these days. Bear in mind, I'm, I'm in recruitment, so I get to hear about a lot of conversations from high level managerial perspectives and that is to talk about your own mistakes first before then bringing up the mistake of somebody else. This helps them to understand that you're not coming at them, you're not attacking them, rather you're saying, hey, I'm a human being too. This is a time when I experienced something similar and maybe, you know, maybe this is something that we can, we can discuss together and change. And by doing that, rather than just coming at somebody with what they've done wrong, it's a lot easier to get them to listen because they know that you are also human and you're on their side at the end of the day. The next is a book that had a huge influence on my viewpoint of femininity this year and I don't see it spoken about very much. It took me such a long time to Google books on femininity from a modern perspective and that is Feminine Lost by Jennifer Granger. 
it's a really fascinating book that completely changed my perspective on a lot this year. So it basically talks about a lot of the things that I've referenced in earlier videos, which is a lot of females are at the point where they feel overworked and burnt out and underappreciated and they really don't quite get why. And it traces a lot of that back to the fact that we have been taught for, for quite a long time now that in order to compete in a male-dominated society, we need to do everything all the time, act like men but better basically. So a lot of women are doing that and getting to these high-level executive positions and then their husbands or their partners or you know what have you are kind of being trained that they've got this, they've got everything covered so they're not really necessarily needed. And when men feel like they're not needed and women feel like they have to do everything, women feel underappreciated and angry and they start behaving very differently than they might do when they're just being their natural selves and men end up being very unhelpful because they've been taught that they don't need to help. And so it kind of takes everything that we're being inadvertently taught at the moment through media and, and a lot that we see in the workplace and it flips it on its head and says here's a way to do things better so that you know what you're good at as a female and you can also appreciate the partners that you're with in such a way that you don't feel taken advantage of and burnt out all the time. It's a really refreshing perspective. It's very even. It's not telling us to go back to the kitchen or do things the way that they used to be. It's talking about how do we use the things that we are good at and make sure that we're not also burning ourselves out and we can we can have loving relationships where we both feel truly fulfilled. What an idea. <laughs> the next is one of the few books that I actually have a physical copy of because most of what I do is through um, Audible and Kindle and that's She's On Your Money by Victoria Devine. She has an Instagram and a podcast that are really good to listen to and this book takes a psychological perspective to finances which I really enjoyed and I haven't really seen before all that much. I'm yet to find a, um, a, a podcast or a medium that really covers things the same way that Victoria does. So if I had to look at one of my biggest takeaways from this book, the first is to do a deep dive into your relationship with money and where there might be childhood trauma associated with it. So for me, I found that I really struggled to, and still do oftentimes, to make budgets. And it's not because I don't want to save, it's because making budgets has given me anxiety for the longest time. And she has you do this exercise that kind of takes you back to childhood when you first felt that. And for me, I uncovered that I developed that anxiety when I was a little girl, because we lived, like many American families, very paycheck to paycheck. Um, times often felt a little bit tough. We always had enough food on the table, the bills were always paid, but there was often this anxiety associated with money. So we'd do things like maybe get to the front of the line at the grocery store and, and have to go and put things back because it wasn't actually in the budget and we were starting to run over. It was a really common experience, but I found that for me personally, it felt like money was lacking. And from that place of lack, I found budgets very restrictive because it made it feel like I didn't have enough money if I had to budget. So this book kind of helps you work through things psychologically to help you get a better relationship with money. And I love that. I find it super refreshing. The other takeaway is to, if you struggle with budgets, so that actually goes along well with what I said before, is to create a lot of different accounts and it's actually easier to keep track of your money if you do things this way. So rather than creating a budget that you have to constantly keep an Excel spreadsheet track of or check in with on a daily basis, instead you create different accounts for different things. Like you might have an emergency account where you put a little bit of money into every week. And then you have something that I, and I can't remember if this is from the book or if I made it up, but an OMG account. So it's like, oh my God, it feels like an emergency, but it's not quite. Where maybe you have a big present to buy that you hadn't budgeted for, or you've got a children's party that ended up blowing up out of proportion in terms of budget and you have an account for that where you constantly put money into it and once you get to a certain point you can invest it or put it into your emergency fund or you can withdraw it if you have that it feels like an emergency but it's not an emergency type moment. So I found that a really handy way to keep track of budgets by having different accounts for different things with different labels where I don't have to think too much. So now we have an account just for bills where it just comes out and I don't think about it and then an account just for spending where I can see when it's starting to get a bit low and maybe we should pull back that week. And that I think is a brilliant modern way to keep track of your money without having it induce anxiety. Thank you so much for watching. If you subscribe, I put out new videos every few weeks. I talk about things like motherhood, self-care, and the things that you need to know as a female in modern society, essentially. So if that interests you, please do like and subscribe. Please do follow me on Instagram as well. It's The Curated Feminine, and I look forward to connecting with you in this little community. Thank you.